Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to see you all here. Um, time to get the show on the road. Um, excited to welcome you to Between the Realms, a storyteller's journey from the ATC to Ragnarok. I'm Keith Webster, the Helen and Henry Posner, Dean of University Libraries, a bunch of other titles. Probably most critically, I'm interim director here at the ATC. And we're delighted to host Goksu Uger, who graduated from the ATC in 2015. Goksu is a game player programmer with over 10 years of experience making games. Driven by curiosity, she uses her creative problem-solving skills to create meaningful gameplay experiences. Prior to her life-changing move from Turkey, Goksu studied computer science and engineering at Sabanchi University. While looking for ways to combine her technical knowledge with her interest in art and design, she found the answer, like many of us, in video games. Following this dream, she earned her Master's of Entertainment Technology here at CMU, where she developed a deep appreciation for working with diverse interdisciplinary teams. Early in her career, she worked as a programmer at Visual Concepts on the NBA 2K franchise. She later shipped titles including PlayStation's God of War and its sequel God of War Ragnarok, both of which received universal acclaim. In conversation with Goksu today is ETC faculty member Brenda Harger. As many of you know, Brenda teaches improvisational acting and leads diverse interdisciplinary projects at the ETC. As an improviser, she has performed with Pittsburgh Theatre Sports and SAK Theatre and has led improv workshops nationally and internationally. Before handing over to Goksu and Brenda, I'd like to recognise Goksu as tomorrow she will be inducted into Carnegie Mellon's Class of 2024, Tartans on the Rise. Tartans on the Rise celebrates recent Carnegie Mellon alumni who are making an impact in their organizations and in their communities across the nation and throughout the world um, using their skills of leadership, innovation, and recognizing their career achievements. Goksu joins a cohort of 30 exceptionally talented young professionals and creators who will be celebrated at a ceremony tomorrow afternoon. And again, congratulations. You are what we believe to be a tartan on the rise. Um, clearly, my advancement colleagues wrote this because I now have to say, if you enjoy this event, please consider supporting the ETC <laughs> with a gift to the general fund. Uh, your donations truly do make a difference. They directly support students by funding new technologies and cutting edge curriculum updates. As a reminder, after the conversation, there will be a reception with food and drink. We hope you'll join us to celebrate Goksu's accomplishments and network with members of the ETC community. With that, I'm done. Enjoy the conversation. Over to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. So, Goksu. Hi. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you. So, um, First of all, congratulations. We are super proud of you, and we're really grateful that you're willing to come back here and tell us about your experiences and hopefully inspire and give some advice to our current students. Have we been explained, the audience have been explained about the questions? It's up there. Okay, so, all right, so you know the drill. Um, so, Goksu, I'm going to yes. start with um, go. where you are now. Uh, so, you are at Santa Monica Studios, Correct. and then, then we're going to. So, I want a little bit about what do you what do you do there? What do you enjoy most? What what's your daily what's your daily work life like? Yeah. So, so can you hear me fine, by the way? All right, great. So, I work at Santa Monica Studio, currently as the lead AI and progression system programmer, um, and. What that means is essentially any system in the game that AI uses, and by AI I mean enemies, companions, um, non-player controlled characters. Um, half of my team writes and implements systems for that. So I am kind of driving the tech, planning long-term, short-term planning, looking at project needs and you know, making sure that we can handle it. And then the other half of my team is the progression team. Again, anything in the game that quest systems, resources, equipments, any management of save data, UI, kind of falls into that half of the team. So it's a big kind of like 
spanning across many different areas kind of a role. Um, and I've been enjoying it a lot. Um, it's exciting to be at Santa Monica Studio because, you know, he played God of War games. It's been very, very exciting couple of years. And I get to work with some people who are best at their jobs. And every day they're kind of like trying to create the next thing. And it's been very exciting to be there and kind of work alongside them. So that's pretty much it. Well, thank you for that introduction to what you do. As I told you before we came in here, um, I really can't ask you any intelligent questions about programming, so I'm going to leave that up to you um, to ask specific questions regarding programming to Gaksu. Instead, I'm going to focus on you and All who right. you are. And so now we're going to go back in time, and I just want to know, what were you like as a child? Like going far back, okay. <laughs> I mean, I can only imagine because I know you, but I want to I hear it from you. What were you like as a child? Yeah, I mean, I, my mom was, a, my dad was a programmer. My mom was a kindergarten teacher. I was just like a regular kid. I had an older sister. Um, I was always kind of like the adventurous, weird kid in the family. Um, you can imagine maybe <laughs> knowing me. Um, I think I was just very curious. Mm -hmm all the time, and I wanted to, you know, learn new stuff, look at things, how, do, how does this work, how does this happen, but I was also kind of very afraid of change, or like new things, which sounds counterintuitive when you think about it, being curious and very afraid of mm -hmm. change, but I think that kind of mix, um, I built this thing where, you know, I would be curious about things, and then I would go about learning about them in a way that feels safe to me, and I kind of have been my way of looking at life at yep. some point, just like finding new things, exploring what I like, ex you know, a lot of trial and error, see what works, see what doesn't, and then stick with what works. And I've kind of developed this thing where I kind of just like the process of learning. And then that kind of turned into me not being very afraid of the change in time. And mm -hmm. I ended up in games industry, which has changed constantly, which would have freaked out the young me. Um, mm -hmm. but not so much, okay, I guess, anymore. So I want to I, I <laughs> fast forward. Well, first of all, you were born in Turkey, right? Yes. In Istanbul. And uh, your undergrad uh, was in what? Sabahçi? Sabanji Sabahçi University. University yes. yeah. um, where you studied computer engineering and visual yeah. communication design. So it sounds to me like you had this right brain, left brain. Yeah. <laughs> all the way in your undergrad. So how did you find the ETC? Yeah, so a bit of a context. In Turkey, when you graduate high school, you kind of apply to the department, not to the school. So okay. by that time, you're like, I'm going to mm -hmm. study computer science. Um, so Banju was the only university in Turkey at the time where you can just go in and then take different lessons from different mm -hmm. departments and then decide what your major is going to be two, ways in, two years into it. Um, and that, that was why I ended up there, because I was like, I have no idea. I have a lot of interests. I like learning. I don't know what I'm mm -hmm. going to do, um, which is why you know, I was taking computer science and engineering um, classes from that department and visual communication design. And then three years into you still, I was like, I like both of these things. Like, mm -hmm. do I have to choose? Can I not choose one? Um, and I, I declared my major as computer science, because that just felt a lot more natural to how my brain works, but mm -hmm. I still wanted to stay close to being creative and, you know, visual design and visual arts, which is when I, I have, I remember that moment very clearly. I went online and I was like, school for arts and computing <laughs> um, at the time. And I think this program, and I knew about Carnegie Mellon, but I didn't know anything about Entertainment Technology Center or anything. This came up, and it said, you know, the school for right and left brain. Mm -hmm. I was like, hey, that's me. <laughs> I can, there are people like me. I can go there. Um, and I've been obsessed with coming here since, since then um, and worked towards it after I found out that this was the place for me. Okay. Well, thank you for that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to jump. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, and then we'll come back. Um, you won several awards while you were at the ETC, and the one you won at graduation is called the Tornado Award. Now, the Tornado Award is an award for someone who really shakes it up, 
<laughs> causes tornadoes by taking advantage of everything that's in front of you, right? So that's the Tornado Award. Gaksu, you were the winner of the Tornado Award that year. You also started by winning the Penguin Award. Can you explain you, both of those things to us? Yes. So why in the world would we give you a Tornado Award? Uh, the, the Penguin Award I got. A Penguin Award, yes. yes. So that was the thing um, that this goes back to, I think, Renu Pasha, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, about like, you know, when the first, until the first penguin jumps into the water, mm -hmm. no one does. So everyone waits for the first penguin. So it was kind of like the symbolic award that they would give during the projects that we do um, during building virtual worlds, where, you know, you jump in, you take the risk, and you do something ridiculous and you fail. Mm -hmm. But it was just a way of celebrating the failure by taking the risk, being the first penguin to jump into the water. Um, and we had this crazy project um, with Oculus, and this is like the very first Oculus. It was not even out mm -hmm. um, yet. This was like the very first version where you couldn't walk, you couldn't even move your head. So it was the Oculus and PS Moves, and there was Leap Motion, which would track the fingers, and it was like a murder mystery game where you would go back in time and relive the moment. And I remember because one of the, again, you cannot move Oculus. So we were like, how do you even become an investigator? Because you need to walk around and solve the crime. Mm -hmm. So we said, oh, no, no, you are sitting on the chair and being investigated. And in your head, you are going back. <laughs> so like, it was like, OK, you cannot move. So we're going to change the story to make it move. <laughs> um, it failed horribly because it was like, three different technologies that just didn't mesh well that well, and the story didn't read. It was, we worked on this like three weeks, so you know, it was very janky, and, but it got us the Penguin Award. <laughs> right, and Penguin Award is a badge of honor for failing spectacularly. So you can just kind of appreciate how that kind of world might have met those uh, criteria. Yeah. Failing spectacularly. Oh, it did fail. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I'm sure you wouldn't have won if it, if it hadn't. Um, so, now I'm going to, uh, while you're at the ETC, I want to know why it is you won the Tornado Award. What, what, what did you take advantage of while you were here, and what influenced you in your work? Um, I think ETC for me, again, like, apart from the fact that, like, I came in here, like, this is my place, like these are my people. Mm -hmm. um, it just, again, it kind of aligned very well. I was talking about like, I, I very much was into exploring and looking what I like and testing what I don't like. So this just meshed really well with it. Like even when I got here, I was like, I don't know. Like I program, I can do some 3D art. Like what do you want me to do? And I, I had different projects. I had a project where I did voice acting, I had a project where I did, was the producer, I took you know, game design classes, I took improvisational acting classes, so it was like just consuming whatever I can and get out of this place the maximum amount of things I can and just taking it with me to again figure out what is next for me, like what is, where do I go from here? Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, so, the, uh, you weren't just a programmer at the ETC, you were also involved in a project, semester-long project, that was uh, sponsored by EA. Uh, and you were listed as the executive producer. How did that happen? Oh, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so this <laughs> was, back then we had a Silicon Valley campus, which was inside the EA Games building in San Mateo. Um, and this was the first year where they wanted to experiment with having two teams do a joint project because mm -hmm. I think it was like, because we work on these projects like what, four months, um, five months. So it's a relatively short time to be able to put something out there that is, you know, polished and clean and working. So I think it was just like, can we have a bigger team and get more content in kind of an experimentation? Um, but we were a team in Silicon Valley of six and then another team here in Pittsburgh of eight. So it was 14 people and this is before COVID time. So remote working really was not something that people were yeah. used to or knew how to communicate. Um, and we struggled a lot. <laughs> um, we didn't know how to work together. You know, 
even three hours difference was a problem. You know, people's work hours weren't matching and there were game designers there, there were game designers in our group, everybody wanted to be the one, you know, driving the charge and everything. And I was a programmer. I started as a programmer. Um, and then in all of that chaos, I started being like, hey, we should do this, we should do that. There's this problem here, let's solve it like this. And I was talking to the EA group who were actually our client and giving us, you know, feedback and our setting our goals and everything. And it started going down and <laughs> I, we kind of realized it's a big team and it's difficult to manage that many people when you are like flat and everyone, you know, does everything. Um, and they said I should be the executive producer and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I had known nothing about production. <laughs> I have no idea what I would do. Um, but then they were like, we think you can do it. We'll support you. Um, there were um, producers in the EA team who were actually, one of them was actually another ETC alumni. So they kind of helped me from like, a, okay, this is how production goes. These are the things you can do this. And I learned a lot of people management skills in that project mm -hmm. that I use to this day. Um, so it was just one of those things like, I don't know how this is going to go, but I guess we'll, we'll take it and let's see how it works. And we actually made a game called Jelly, Jelly Pirates in Jelly Space. Jelly Pirates, yeah. It was, it was actually a lot of fun. Um, yeah. Used your, used your phones as your controller yeah. and you played on the television. It was a co-op game. Yeah, so co-op game. All family has a phone they use as yeah. a controller. The game is on the TV. There's a video on YouTube that's worth looking at. <laughs> it was a very it was a very fun, very inventive yeah. uh, game. So, so you're talking about the skills that you learned at the ETC. Um, how do they translate into your work now? Yes, yeah, so Definitely um, a lot of, as I mentioned, from that project and overall kind of ETC is a place where you work with teams a lot and, you know, there was a lot of like team skills and people relationship skills that I use constantly. Um, ETC is also like people from all over the world and um, very diverse kind of a environment. So that kind of makes me appreciate that more because I've seen it work really well. So I kind of like try to bring that into workplace. Um, Again, like we were constantly in situations that we were not comfortable with. We were using technology that was new. Like, again, Oculus was not even out. We were making games for Oculus here. So mm -hmm. it was a lot of like, okay, you know, I, I have a new technology that I'm not comfortable using, but I need to learn. So, you know, it's not about what the tool is. It's about what you want to deliver. So there was that kind of like understanding, okay, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are, and as long as you know you want to make something good, you can make it work. Kind of attitude that I yeah. think still carried over. Kind yeah. of enjoying the mess and chaos and the vagueness, because that's game development to yeah. me. Well, and I, I like to call it. Don't worry about it so much. Yeah. Just just do the work, right? Explore, and with yeah. a curious personality, that really helps. Yeah, um, so you mentioned um, something that's, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. Um, you came from Turkey. Mm -hmm. So you were an international student. Was this your first time in the U.S. coming um, to the I did, get, I did come as a tourist before. Okay, okay. Um, but, but, but not living here. Not living here. Okay. That was definitely the so first time. you were an international student and uh, you're a programmer and you were a woman. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of... Uh, so you say first, you were probably the only Turkish student. Uh, you were probably a small percentage of the women in the program at that time who were programmers. And I just want you to, you know, share a little bit about that experience with us. Uh, yeah, so I'll start from the language. Obviously, I, I grew up speaking Turkish, so English is a second language. And as much as, you know, I can speak and I watch movies and done all the classes and everything, it mm -hmm. is still a little bit intimidating being in here and like even when I started working and even in here like I would be in meetings and I would have to like focus on one person and what they're saying because I could not you know listen to multiple things uh, so there was even like stuff like that there's a lot of like culture shock that mm -hmm. happened again I came as a tourist but it's not the same as living here you know even the simplest jokes sometimes wouldn't hit me I was like that's funny why I, I don't know <laughs> um, so there's a lot of that for sure um, and then there's a little bit of like 
do I belong here kind of a feeling that comes in sometimes. Because, um, you know, you look around, you, you know, you kind of feel like out of, there are not that many people that looks like you. There are not that many people that thinks like you. I come from a completely different culture. So there was definitely a little bit of that um, mm -hmm. that I had to kind of in time work through. That you know, start, I started that work at ATC and you know, much more into my career and thinking about that and kind of working around it and yeah. making it work for me. Yeah. Well, I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. I do want to point out that after you graduated, you gave a, a talk at GDC in an experimental game play workshop, and you used one of your BVW worlds I did. as an example. So after you graduated, you still pulled the BVW world out. Yeah, so that was, it was one of the, the one that actually did at the GDC was our second round, so there are ATC students in here. So that's like the, literally the second game that we worked on. Um, we had two weeks and we made something with Kinect um, and then, you know, it was very well received, everyone really enjoyed and then we kind of forget about it. It's also like a student project, you make a game, you know, we don't even believe you made anything good or anything worth showing. Um, but there were a lot of people who went to Game Developers Conference to this very, very famous talk at the time called Experimental Gameplay Workshop. It was just meant to celebrate you know, different ideas, kind of different ways of using different, you know, different tools in games or just overall kind of experimental stuff that may or may not be working, but someone out there did this, so it might, you know, spark some inspiration. Um, and someone, I don't really recall who, was like, hey, you know, you, that game that you had is a good candidate, like, you can submit it there. Obviously, we're like, our game? No, it's not good, it's bad, and then... We kind of talked to you know teammates and we kind of got together again, kind of improved it a little bit from, because it was a game done in two weeks again, it was like a game jam game. Um, kind of put it together a little bit better and then submitted it and then it made it in. Awesome. And you had another game at Indiecade, also a BVW world. Yes. That one was called The Last Egg. <laughs> that was played with uh, PS Moves. It was a competitive three versus three, kind of mm -hmm. like a playground game, which actually when we had the ETC festival, that was the first time that we actually had to make the guests sign waivers because there was <laughs> risk of injury because it was just like running around and tapping each other's PS moves that mm -hmm. people got very competitive. People got into it. Um, and they were like hay bales because it's called Last Egg. The idea was that, you know, you were two teams of three chickens, and there's just one egg left. So you're trying to protect your one egg and keep it in your team. And if someone, you know, taps your PS move, it goes to the other team. So there was a lot of, like, tackling and, like... I remember this game. <laughs> um, now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because we often think that the work that we do at the ETC is just kind of, like you know, insignificant, and that it really doesn't lead to much. It's just a practice of something that we do here. And you're a great example of, no, you get, it has a life beyond the ETC, and it gives you a way to show off your work and open doors, but you have to submit it. Right? Yeah. So. It, it was also a big, you know, boost of confidence. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I made a thing, and people liked it. Yeah. And, you know, it was nice. Awesome. So I'm going to go back to your, your current passion. In, in, in addition to making games, um, you, you wrote here, uh, as much as I love making games, I also acknowledge, acknowledge that despite improvements in recent games, uh, in recent years, the game industry has a lot of issues. Um, I strongly believe I have a responsibility and the means to give back and join in efforts to help shape the future of our industry together. So, and then you list a long list of things that you do to give back. And I wonder if you could share some of those things with yeah, us. I didn't know you were going to read that whole thing. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, it kind of, mm -hmm. the why of it kind of goes back to what I was talking about a little bit. So, um, when I first started working in industry, and it's very clear the numbers, there are not enough women, um, there are not enough women in programming or tech departments, and, you know, I grew up in Turkey, like, I would just kind of look around and see people that are, like, vastly different than me, and 
at the time, the way I kind of thought dealing with that was, oh, I'm just going to be one of the boys, you know, like I'll, mm -hmm. I'll be one of them, I'll change and, you know, fit in, which just today I was watching something actually that said, you know, like the opposite of belonging is fitting in. Mm -hmm. Because belonging doesn't need you to change. Right. Um, so there was a little bit of like, I don't feel like I belong feeling that at the time I didn't know that's what I was doing. I was fitting in. Hmm. Um, but in time, I met with a lot of women or like on people from, you know, underrepresented communities in the games. And I kind of got to talk to them a little bit. And, you know, there was like, oh, I was not crazy. Like this mm -hmm. takes a toll on you and it is rough and you need representation out there. You need to see examples out there, people that are doing this thing that, mm -hmm. you know, you feel like, oh, I can do that too. Um, and I was, I was very lucky, you know, Santa Monica studio where I work had two different studio heads that were women uh, during the time that I worked there and I got to watch them. I got to, you know, see how they communicate, how they deal with problems and mm -hmm. It was kind of like this moment of like awakening of like, oh, you know, you don't need to be one of the boys or you don't, you know, leadership is not, you know, what they put out there. Like this is how a good leader reacts. It's just yeah. you can find your own ways and lean into your own strengths and, you know, make a big change and make an impact. And that was kind of like a turning moment, I guess, for mm -hmm. me, like where I was like, th that opened up a lot of doors for me, that idea of like, oh, I can... I don't have to be one of the boys, but I can find what's unique about me and what's strong about me, and I can use that. Mm -hmm. um, I was so lucky again. A lot, I had a lot of people that were, you know, supporting me and all of that. So I kind of like, because I've been through that, I thought, oh my God, like I had so much support that changed me. What if I can do the same thing for other people? So, mm -hmm. you know, I do that work not because, you know, it's like a corporate quota, not because, you know, some sense of social duty, but more like, it's very personal to me. Mm -hmm. I've had that support and I kind of want to do the same for others. So the way I look at it is usually like either, not just women, any underrepresented community, community either they're not getting the opportunities um, early on in their lives. Like mm -hmm. I work with young girls who are, you know, interested in stamps to get them, mm -hmm. you know, encouraged and more into stamps if that's what, something they want to do. Um, I work with, you know, schools and universities and kind of, again, encourage um, women and, you know, underrepresented, underrepresented communities there as well. And then the second part of it is like, even if people have the opportunities and then they mm -hmm. get in, they don't have the support to, you know, progress in their careers. They don't feel seen, they don't feel supported. And there's a big amount of women who are like dropping out later in their career too because of those. So then it is like, okay, once we extend the opportunities and get them in there, how do we keep them in there? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of like, you know, mentorship and, you know, finding people mm -hmm. who needs that kind of help and yeah. do whatever I can. Were you mentored? Huh? Were you mentored as a child? I was mentored, yeah, when I mm -hmm. got into the um, industry, yeah. Okay. Okay. So couple of questions more and then I'm going to open it up to your questions. Yeah. Um, what do you wish you had known when you came and started here? This is, this is like the advice yeah. to the ETCers of today, right? What, what did you wish you had known? I think like, and we were told this many, many times and I think it still didn't dawn on me. Like, this is the place where you fail. Like, this is the place. Mm -hmm. There are no consequences where you mm -hmm. experiment and fail or succeed, but, you know, don't be afraid about yep. it. And again, like, we were told about this constantly. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> fails fast, fail safe. I, it, I just didn't get her what that meant. Yeah. Um, you know, once you're in industry, you know, there's financial things and, you know, the industry changes and all of this, that kind of, like you have to be sometimes a little more conservative in what you do and how you do things versus here, you can go crazy. You can do things, you know, we would not be able to do later on. So I would say, you know, take advantage of that really. All right. And uh, well, I guess that leads into the last question that I have is what, what advice would you give them? Um, to the ETCers right today, what should they be doing? What should they be doing? Um, they should prepare. <laughs> um, so, 
especially entertainment and games and you know it's very high demand right now mm -hmm. it's a lot of competition and people have been making games since they're kids now which is crazy not what i had i made my first game here at adc so mm -hmm. it is going super fast so just you know get comfortable with the change get comfortable adapting and not being afraid of learning new things um and kind of do your homework mm -hmm. um, in terms of like, okay, you want to be a programmer, what does that mean? Like, or you want to be a designer. That changes from studio to studio, from, you know, type of game you're making. It has a lot of different things. So whatever you want to do, reach out to people in that discipline and just talk and ask genuine questions, not just for the sake of networking, um, but actually, you know, be curious. Again, be curious and try to learn what works for you. Um, and then I think part of it is also like, it is intimidating once you get out there. Cause again, it's a very, very competitive industry mm -hmm. and you feel like, you know, everyone has everything figured out and you're the only one, like the imposter syndrome mm -hmm. is real, but no one has it figured out. Okay. <laughs> everyone is still trying to find their way. Um, and just, just know that, you know, it's, yeah. everyone is still trying, I'm still trying to figure out things. So, mm -hmm. so what do you want to do next? I know you're working on something right now that is, you know, a big secret, so I know you can't share yeah. <laughs> what you're working on, but just theoretically, like, you know, in the, what, what do you want to do that you haven't done? I know, well, I do, I do want to bring up your aerial work. Oh. You've become a circus performer, um, which is pretty exciting. So your it world is. is kind of converging in a way that's, yeah. that's kind of cool. Um, but what, what, what are you working on next? Yeah, I'll quit gaming and run away with circus is my, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> is my plan. <laughs> Doing the opposite way. Because when, when I first came to ETC, Jesse Shell was like, oh, you know, I ran away with circus when I was yeah. a kid. And I know, you know, juggling blades. And I was like blown away. Like, oh, like that's, that's a life that mm -hmm. I wouldn't even imagine. And now I'm going the other way and doing the games thing and then running away with the circus. Um, but yeah, so I'm professionally, I guess. Um, so I've been a lead for four years now, three years, I don't even know. So it's practically still very new. So that's exciting for me mm -hmm. to kind of like, as I grow my team and get to know people, get to kind of like know the work that we do together. So that's definitely something that I'm like, okay, what is next? Where do I go from here? Is definitely something that I'm right now mm -hmm. constantly thinking about. Um, and I'm kind of looking for ways outside of my work to kind of get me, again, the circus thing. It was just like, oh, I'm going to do a physical activity and go try an aerial class. And I got hooked. Like, this was actually funny because a friend of mine was like, oh, yeah, I want to try an aerial class. Do you want to come with me? And I was like, sure, I'll come. And then he dropped. Like, he was like, nope, not doing this yeah. anymore. And I was just like there every day of the week. Um, but the interesting thing right now about it is like I started for like a physical activity and it turned into like I'm building acts now, I'm doing sh shows and mm -hmm. it is feeding this interesting sort of like inspiration back into my work. So yeah, yeah. we'll see, we'll see where we go. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for all of that. And now I'm going to check if we have any questions from the audience. I'm going to take a sip of water while you do that. All right. Now I have to see if I can actually read my phone. Okay. Um, so these are programming-related questions. Thank you for that. Um, how often do you create a new system to enable possible design space, and how often does the opposite happen, and design has a need that you create a system for? Good question. Oh, yes. Um, it is difficult to say like this is when this happens and this is when this happens because it, it is for me a very like organic um, kind of working with design. I'm a gameplay programmer so I work with design a lot. So a lot of the time, especially you know if it's a new project or something like that, they will be like, hey, I have this cool idea. This is going to be like it's and I'm like, yeah, our engine has nothing that you can use to make that happen. So. Mm -hmm. From there on, it's a conversation, and it's kind of like a lot of back and forth. Like sometimes it's like, okay, this is the tech constraint. We need to find a creative solution to work around this. And sometimes they are like, no, this is very important to us. So whatever resource you have, we need to, you know, 
solve this technical problem. So mm -hmm. it's back and forth. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of times where they will like, oh, I want to do this, and we get it in the game, and I'm like, this is not working. So like, I suggest something, and then they go back and change their design. So again, it's just very much iteration and organic, kind of like sharing the problem solving and working together that, you know, it's difficult to tell. Like, this is exactly when I implement something new. It just happens. Um, but definitely a lot of that. Like, OK, constantly. awesome. Thank you. All right. As a programmer, I imagine much of your skill set was developed through work experience. So what skills do you recommend focusing on in school or in um, your early career? Yes. I, I'll dive into this because <laughs> we were talking yesterday with Dave, too, and I got so excited about this. Um, so <laughs> I will talk about that a little bit. I, I, what happened to me, and you know, I think this is just like a shared experience with a lot of people when we are in school, especially in a school like this where it's like very project based, we're making games and it's usually like new game, you start to scratch, you know, code base is clean, it's usually like two programmers or something, you go, you know, crazy and implement something and it works and then you forget, you know, ditch that, start again. Um, it's very rare that we actually get a code base that's like 20 years old and there's a lot of history and context, and even the simplest thing don't work out the way that you think they would work out. Um, and you need to have the skill of like looking at someone else's code, being able to debug through it, and work in a work in an environment that is not, you know, you cannot Google how do I do this in Unity because a lot of the big studios, including Sony Santa Monica, we have our own engines. Mm -hmm. So being able to problem solve in a space that you are not, you don't know, or you cannot ask questions to the internet, um, being able to debug. Um, and then, again, Unity and Unreal and these engines out there, they're great to start making games and get a lot of practical experience. But when you get into working at a studio like Santa Monica, fundamentals start mattering a lot more, like data structures, algorithms, and linear algebra, which is like, I feel like a lot of the time, especially with the engines coming in and everything being so easy, we kind of forget about them. We learn them in school and forget about them. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they become more important. Um, so as a programmer, I would say focus on those. And that will get you ahead of the curve, I think. You're echoing what we say all the time. Learn how to learn. <laughs> so that's great. Thank you. All right. Any advice from? Wait, any advice from completing an AI to optimizing it? Okay, is there any design principles when designing AI? Designing or programming, I that kind of different things, but they kind of merge sometimes. I guess I'll just, yeah, it doesn't specify. I'll give like an overall. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the biggest thing I learned about game AI is that. It's not necessarily the smartest AI that gives you the best gameplay experience. Mm -hmm. In fact, sometimes you want your enemies to not be so smart. So <laughs> I guess kind of like keep that in mind going in and play test a lot, see what works from like a design perspective. And then having a goal designing an AI, like again, I'll, enemy is an easier example, so I will go with that. Um, going into it with a goal in mind. So I want mm -hmm. this enemy or this fight to be about, you know, Speed. I want to test players' speed. So I'm going to have attacks that are putting that into question. Or, um, you know, I want the player at this point in the fight to, you know, change from doing this attack all the time to do this. You know, I'll, if the player is just like smashing all the time, maybe I add an attack to prevent them from doing it. So I kind of like change it on them. So kind of going into it with a goal is important. And then when it comes to the systems, and because mm -hmm taking this as a programming question. Um, a lot of the time, optimization comes up a lot because if you have small swarm of enemies, it becomes difficult. Um, it's just, it's difficult to answer like a generic way like this because what game, what kind of enemy, is it a crowd, is it just mm -hmm. like specifics? It's just depends on the situation. Um, but know your tools, know the things you can do. There are a lot of things out there um, about how to go about implementing those kind of systems. So do your research and... And know what yeah. you want in the first place. Know what, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Whoops. I knew this would happen. 
Uh-oh. Okay. Yeah, I just exited out. Um, yeah, I, I bumped one thing, you know. Okay, so I lost all of the questions. Fine. So if you can no. uh, hand me here. <laughs> Thank you. Also, if you ask the questions and you're here, and what I, what I like, answered to is not, you want more, you know, come find me after and I can talk more. <laughs> okay, I, I have another question for you. So looking back at your time at the ETC, is there something that stands out that best prepared you for your life as an industry leader? And were there any surprises? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yes. So I think in the, in the rush of like, oh, I'm going to get into the industry, I'm going to do this, there was a lot of like focusing on my, you know, technical skills and game making yeah. and all of that, which is good. You need to have that down. Um, but I, and I have, you know, ETC alumni friends and everything, and we talk about this all the time. The biggest thing that we got out of this place is working with a team, working with people mm -hmm. and how to kind of work through problems together mm -hmm. um, is definitely something that I took so away with So even knowing that this program was all about teamwork, it was still a surprise. It was. <laughs> it is interesting because, yep. again, like, I didn't come here to... I'm going to work in teams, right? It yeah. was just like, oh, I, you know, I'm going to make games and all of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, the industry is high competition. So you want to, yeah. you know, be at your best game. And I am interviewing right now, mm -hmm. you know, people who are wanting to get into the industry and everything. And that's also one of the first things I do. Like, okay, you got your technical things down, you made your games, but how are you in a team setting? How yeah. are you, are you going to be able to work um, with us and, you know, that is a big focus, and you know, when we were here, we used to say nobody wants to work with a jerk, and it was like kind of like a joke, but yeah, no, it is very true. Nobody wants to. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, okay, thank you for that answer. Uh, what do you think of the current state of the games industry, including early access, subscriptions, and the decline in support for physical media? Isn't this one of the made-up questions? No? And, oh, sorry? It's a question. Okay. <laughs> it is a question. Okay. Well, and the decline in support for physical media preservation. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to take that question. So, I mean, I am a game developer first, and I, of course, do follow what's happening in the industry and everything, but mm. I'm one of those people, you know, the different consoles are going to come and go and different, you know, payment methods are going to come and go. Different types of games are going to be, you know, high and low and everything. Mm -hmm. I just think at the end of the day, it's the experience that, mat that matters and mm -hmm. I just focus on creating the best experience. So my thoughts on that, yeah, okay. the, the game industry always changes. There's always something, new tech, old tech, new, new game that is very famous and making a lot of money and all, everybody wants to make that game, but... I'm more like I'm an I'm a experience builder, so I'm going to focus on that kind of a person. So probably did not answer your question the way you wanted to. I don't know who asked it, but <laughs> this is my take. Well, <laughs> we'll move on to the next one then. This is specifically about God of War, Ragnarok. Oh. Ragnarok. Okay. What was it like to take all those sy the systems you developed and adapt them for a new, new genre for the Ragnarok Rogue like DLC? Very specific here. Very what specific. was surprisingly easy or difficult? Okay, um, for clarification, I did not very closely work with the DLC. At that time, I had already moved on to this project that I am working on right now. That being said, oh. I did have to support it from time to time. So I can, it, it is a lot of challenge to not, it wasn't a big technical challenge, I think, in the way that, you know, we had a lot of the systems down, so it wasn't a big challenge, but it was a very big design challenge because the systems and the progression, how your skills, you know, expand and how the enemies' encounters are, you know, specifically crafted for an action-adventure game was very different from, from a roguelike game. So there was a lot of, like, okay, like, how do we make fighting the same enemy again and again fun because in the regular game that's usually not the experience and then how do we make progression systems kind of work within that 
because our systems and our skill building and you know weapon skills and everything was not set up for that. So it was a lot of like, again, we are very playtest driven studio and we have playtests happen very early on in the in the process mm -hmm. and. You know, we have a whole department devoted to user research and asking the right questions and mm -hmm. getting that data and reading that data and kind of communicating it back to the design so that they can make informed decisions. So it was a lot of playtesting and seeing what works. Okay, thank you. Uh, what seemingly unrelated skills have proven the most useful? I'm assuming that's in life in general or specific to the ETC, it's not clear, but hmm. I think. Hmm. Unrelated. I have to think about that one a little bit because everything I can think of is kind of like stuff we talked about already a mm -hmm. lot and none of those seem very unrelated. Um, huh. Well, it could be that there is no such thing as an unrelated skill to you. That's a very good I way think. of thinking it. <laughs> <laughs> Being a curious personality, yeah. that seems to me yeah. that would be the case. Because, yeah, like, even, mm -hmm. even my circus thing kind of fed back into my work. So I'm like, yeah, there's no unrelated skill. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of more. Um, it has been nine years since your graduation, and you are now leading a team in a world-renowned franchise. How did you make it? what preparation is needed. I think you've covered a lot of that already, yeah. but um, in a nutshell. Yeah, how do, I think some of it was also like personality-wise, I'm a big problem solver, like curiosity and problem solving kind of like came natural to me. So a lot of the time I would just like see something and try to solve it, which kind of evolved into me being on this like leadership position track. Um, Again, our studio was amazing to me. So we had a lot mm -hmm. of like people supporting me and kind of like guiding me through that. Um, but it was like I didn't, I didn't set out to be in this role when I was getting in the industry nine years ago. I didn't even set out to make games when I came to ETC. So like yeah. everything in my life has just been like I don't know what I'm doing. So I'll just follow Go what through. life throws at yeah. me. Um, That's awesome. So go through that open door. All right. Um, okay. Here, a couple more. What was it like watching technology and your programming skills evolve alongside series like God of War, and comparing it to previous entries? My Not sure skills. I understand it completely. Yeah, I don't under. Is the previous entries talking about Greek era of I God of War? Is the <laughs> I don't know if it's previous entries to the game or to... To my skills. Uh, you've yes. done before. Oh, no oh. words. <laughs> Um, yeah, I cannot talk much to obviously PS2 era because I wasn't there. Although we still have a lot of code from that era that is in the code base that no one knows what it is doing, but everyone is afraid to take it out. So it's just, <laughs> it's just there. <laughs> it is a 20 year old code base, so there's a lot of that. Um, but we did go through PS4, PS5 in the last Ragnarok game, and obviously there's a like big hardware improvement that comes with it and then there's the controller changes and everything um, so I mean as a gameplay programmer it doesn't really make huge differences like it does a lot of differences for graphics and resource load loading and textures and everything gameplay as a gameplay programmer you're essentially just like yes bound by the limits of the technology but you do what you do um, the good thing is like right now we are only PS5 I can have, you know, more enemies on the screen maybe and I can have more, you know, there's that, there's that bit of like effect to the gameplay um, and then fast traveling is going to be a lot faster, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I don't know, does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, um, so do you have any advice for a solo indie dev who is currently developing their first game? 
Uh, how do you stay motivated and avoid being overwhelmed? I don't know if I'm the best person to ask this question. I have 10 projects I started in hopes to make my own game and then left them behind. Um, so if you, if you do find ways of staying motivated, um, let me know, because I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> OK. So um, what kind of electives did you take at the ETC? Oh. And how did they influence your work? Yes. I took game design mm -hmm. from Jesse here. Um, I did improv two and three. Um, at some point, at the end of first year, I thought I was going to be a game designer. So I went to SV campus. Mm -hmm. I took game design from Stone Librande there. So it was another game design class, which actually, you know, like I was like, oh, I'm going to take two game design classes. It's just going to be a repetition. It was not at all. Yeah. They were completely different classes for completely different things. But it's kind of like, because as a gameplay programmer, I get to work with design a lot. Mm -hmm. It kind of gave me a lot of insight and understanding into how they think and that kind of, I think, made me a better gameplay programmer. Improv, I talk about this a lot. It's just the best thing ever that happened to me, I think, working in the game industry. <laughs> it's not that because you're here, but I uh, do talk well. about it a lot. Um, it just let me not take myself too seriously, first and foremost. It is a really good team working tool. If you took improv here, it's the yes and rule. Like it's just, that is what I do at work every day. Designers come at me and they're like, I'm gonna do this crazy thing that's gonna break all of your systems. And I'm like, yes, and? <laughs> um, there's a little bit of that. It helped me like think creatively. Like when you get to a block, you know, it kind of like built that muscle in me to kind of think mm -hmm. outside the box and think creatively. I also took entrepreneurship class in SV Campus from yep. Carl. Which, you know, I'm terrified of like, of having my own business and I, I hope to have, you know, my own Studio One game. That's, you know, the big dream and it kind of like gave me a little bit more confidence of like, oh, you know, like I can do it. That's, there's a world out there that I can kind of know just a little bit about. Um, and we were in like Silicon Valley at the time, so like everything around us was about entrepreneurship. So that was a really good experience of like getting in there a little bit and learning small bit of how that world works. Um, yeah. Well, I think that is a perfect place to end. Yeah. And I am very um, pleased that you were willing to spend this last hour mm. with us. It's very exciting to have you here. It's great and of to be course, back. we are always proud of our alums, but we are especially proud of you. Oh, thank you. So, thank you. <laughs> Thanks.